Last week, we discussed soil mixes. In that episode, we discussed the more mechanical qualities of the soil, such as the soil composition, water retention, and drainage. In this episode, we're going to discuss the chemical qualities of the soil, such as the soil pH and nutrients. I've been stressing the point that you shouldn't just blindly copy what others are doing. Instead, you should see what's the best for your situation. Yes, I'm doing that here too. Before we dive into it, let me just start with the disclaimers. When it comes to fertilizing succulents, there seems to be two camps of opposing opinions. The first would be those who do fertilize their plants, and the second are those who don't. It might appear that I fall in that second camp, but depending on how you look at it, I fall somewhere in between. Succulents do not need that much nutrients anyway. In their natural state, they thrive in arid or nutrient-poor areas and this is where the proponents of the no fertilizer camp are coming from on the other hand succulents are still living things and they would appreciate a bit of nutrition plants in cultivation have obviously different growing conditions from those growing in the wild take your typical domesticated dog for instance we tend to feed them kibble you do not tend to feed them raw meat because that would just upset their tummies well we can but that does not come with its own set of problems. Anyway, my point here is that cultivated plants are no longer exactly the same as their wild counterparts. So you couldn't expect everything to be the same. I think the better approach here is to understand how fertilizers work so you can decide whether you need to apply them or not. Aside from the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen that the plants receive from the air and water, there are at least 13 elements that the plants would need for proper growth. Plants generally grow normally until they run out of at least one of these elements, and this leads to limited growth. Problems also arise if there are excess of them, as this leads to discoloration or deformation. Succulents will of course grow better in the long run if you give them a bit of nutrients. This have to be carefully managed though because excess of some nutrients can lead into deficiencies of others. It is generally better to use a complete formulation rather than applying large amounts of a single type of element. I'm looking at you people who directly apply MSG on their plants. There are seven elements making up the macronutrients. These are calcium, carbon, magnesium, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. These macronutrients are the nutrients that the plant needs mainly. While there are a bunch of other nutrients, other elements that they would need in smaller amounts. And those would be the micronutrients. Calcium is the major component of cell walls. It is important for root tips and growth. A deficiency of calcium results in poor root development with weak tips, distorted curled leaves, and hooked tips. An excess of calcium results in iron deficiency in sensitive plants. Carbon. Carbon is the major component of all organic compounds, including carbohydrates such as starch and cellulose, fats and oils, proteins, and these are normally obtained from air. A deficiency of this results in reduced growth rate, while an excess results in enhanced growth. This is usually done in greenhouses. Magnesium. Magnesium is essential for chlorophyll formation and a cofactor for many enzyme reactions. A deficiency of this leads to leaf yellowing, and an excess of magnesium leads to calcium deficiency which of course we just mentioned is poor root development and weak tips nitrogen nitrogen is essential for proper leaf and stem growth and protein synthesis a lack of nitrogen results in reduced growth pale yellow green leaves starting with the oldest leaves and an excess causes potassium deficiency phosphorus phosphorus is important for germination and growth of seeds roots, flowers, and fruit production. A lack of it results in reduced growth, small bluish green leaves becoming bronzy purple or with scorched brown edges and falling off early starting with the oldest. An excess of phosphorus also results in potassium deficiency. Potassium. Potassium promotes vigorous growth and disease resistance. A lack of potassium results in stunted growth with closely spaced leaves, scorched brown leaf tips and edges, and rolled edges starting with the oldest. An excess of potassium causes calcium and magnesium deficiency. Sulfur. 
Sulfur is essential for protein synthesis and chlorophyll formation. It can also be used to acidify soil. A lack of sulfur results in slow growth with small rounded brittle leaves. An excess of sulfur in sulfur dioxide form causes bleached or pigmented necrotic areas in broad leaf plants and chlorotic spots and bands or brown tips. Young leaves are most sensitive to this. Too much sulfur can also lower your pH too much. There are a bunch of other elements which are only required in trace amounts, so I won't go into details. Synthetic fertilizers tend to be fast acting and comes in various forms such as liquid, granules, pellets, etc. They are water soluble and they are taken by the plant almost immediately. It's like providing your plants with a quick hit of nutrients. Everything happens rapidly, but it does not last as long as organically derived fertilizers. And for this reason, you would have to reapply them depending on the dosage instructions. Just make sure to follow the label. If you apply too much, then your plants would be taking in too much nutrients and they end up burning. Natural or organic fertilizers are different in that apart from providing the nutrients, they also improve the soil in some way. That's if you use them properly. The amount of nutrients in organic fertilizers tend to be lower than synthetic ones, but they feed the plants for a longer period of time. As a result, the impact of organic fertilizers is subtle because it takes a longer period of time to see results. But as far as nutrients go, there's virtually no difference between synthetic and organically derived fertilizers. As far as the plant is concerned, they're the same thing. So one is not necessarily better than the other, it's just a matter of dosage and delivery. So work your way around that. Single or straight fertilizers versus compound fertilizers. So as the name suggests, single fertilizers or straight fertilizers are those types which only provide a single amount or a single source of nutrient. While compound fertilizers have at least two and maybe more. Straight fertilizers are good for fixing specific deficiencies, but otherwise it's generally better to use, you're better off just using complete fertilizers because you're addressing all of the needs. There are many methods of delivery such as foliar, granular, controlled release, slow release, all sorts of stuff. All you need to know is that some methods are more instant, while others such as the slow release and controlled release will release these nutrients for a set period of time. Controlled release fertilizers activate under a specific set of conditions such as heat and moisture which means that these things are inert during winter. They do nothing. This can be good since a lot of plants are dormant when it gets too cold anyway. Another thing that gets many people tripped would be soil tonics. A lot of these are based on seaweed solutions and a popular brand here in Australia is sea salt. It's important that you do not confuse soil tonics or soil conditioners with fertilizers because they are not the same thing. They do entirely different set of things. Soil tonics are additives to your soil that increase soil life and microbial activity and this in turn improves the efficiency of nutrient absorption in plants. Tonics stimulate root development and it boosts flowering and fruit development due to the increased activity of pollinators since more flowers, more bees and stuff. It also strengthens the cell walls, making it a bit thicker, stronger, which makes it more resistant to pests and fungi. It also provides some degree of resiliency to extreme temperatures because this fluids, this mixture, tends to freeze at negative 6 degrees Celsius or about 21.2 Fahrenheit, which means that if they are absorbed by the plant, this could provide some sort of, some degree of protection against cold or tolerance to cold your plants would not freeze at zero degrees or 32 Fahrenheit, but rather at much lower temperatures. But of course, make sure to follow the instructions on the label. You generally have to dilute it to the point that it is light colored. And in the case of succulents, since they need a lot less, you might have to make it even more diluted that there's barely a tint in the color of the water. Another thing you need to know about this is that there's no NPK content in it, which means that you can use it with any plant. To make it easier to understand, let's use an analogy. Soil tonics is like placing someone in intensive care. You're focusing on getting them well before they can start feeding themselves. You can also think of it as exercising. A well-conditioned human is healthier than those without exercise. Fertilizers would be the food, and the more that you work out, the more food you can take. Like exercising, you can do it anytime, preferably before growing periods. You could also use it in preparation for winter frost. That way they would be more resilient to the cold 
just make sure not to use too much because you do not want to overstimulate them since they have to go dormant too. So key points so far, number one, plants do not differentiate between organic and synthetic fertilizers as far as nutrients is concerned. It's all a matter of dosage and delivery. So you do not have to be very concerned or be very particular about the brand. All you have to do is to look at behind at the label and look at the distribution of the nutrients. Organic fertilizers have a lower NPK content, which means that you would need more of them. Organic fertilizers release nutrients slowly, and this could be good or bad, depending on the type of plant that you have. Organic fertilizers, such as compost or manure, have other benefits aside from the nutrients, and that's conditioning your soil, providing active microbial life, which makes it easier to break down stuff and generally improves the soil. And finally, soil pH. Soil pH can affect plant growth. The ideal range would be 5.5 to 7. That's somewhere between slightly acidic to very neutral. And the soil pH does not indicate fertility, but rather how easy it is for your plants to absorb nutrients from the soil. If the pH level is too high or too low, then your plants would not be able to absorb them properly. Also, if the soil is too acidic, then the nutrients will leach down to the soil much faster. You're going to lose the nutrients. And if the pH gets low enough, then aluminum would be soluble in water. And this is a bad thing because aluminum inhibits growth by restricting access to water and nutrients. Given that you know the type of soil that I use and that's mostly organic, then you would be able to extrapolate the fact that I tend to be using more of organic fertilizers than synthetic fertilizers. And this is why my plants are exhibiting good growth, I guess. It's not that I'm opposed to using synthetic fertilizers. In fact, very much the opposite. I would very much use them if I need to, but in this case, I don't have to. Because as you can see, they're clearly growing really well. My plants get their nutrition basically from the base of my soil which is compost and like I've been saying many times my soil is rich and I just add pebbles for drainage. This way I do not have to worry much about spending on fertilizer. I don't have to reapply regularly and everything is coming at a low amount that I it's a set and forget system. I don't have to think about it anymore and I'm sticking to this method because I'm a cheapskate I just have to prepare the soil once and by letting some of the leaves decompose in there, some of the nutrients is brought back so I do not have to do much. Set and forget. This approach may not be for everyone because I have my plants in the ground. It makes sense for me in this case. But having them in pots, you might end up having to replace the soil maybe once every few years. And it's not something that I'm keen on doing. But for cases like that, synthetic fertilizers would be ideal. So again, it's all a matter of looking into your situation and see what your plant needs. This is going to be the last episode of my educational content. And from the next episode onwards, I'm going to continue working on my garden. It's landscaping time. And it's no coincidence that I've been sitting and standing right on this spot in front of my Patreon shrine. Because in the next episode, I'll be working, I'll be continuing landscaping this area. I'm going to tidy it up, clean it up, and do a lot more planting. So, I'll see you then. Bye. Sariska Pades is made possible with the support of my Patreon sponsors. Patreon allows you to support content creators like me with a small monthly donation. You can pledge your support by heading over to patreon.com slash If you're in Australia, I've got some of my plants for sale. Check out my plant shop at seriscapades.com slash theplantshop with dashes.